Hi, my name is Poppy Livermore and I'm a recent graduate of the Fashion PR and Communication course. I'm part of class of the class 2020, class of 2020, I can't even speak. Um, and yes, yeah, so me and Monet, who will introduce ourselves, are going to have a discussion about diversity and inclusion within the beauty and fashion industry. And I'll pass over to Monet. Um, so I'm Monet Loren and I was in Poppy's class where we both did fashion PR and communications um, and as she said we've just graduated. Um, I also do eyelashes on the side as well um, but we're both um, interested in like fashion PR and like beauty and stuff like that so and of course inclusion and diversity so it'll be really interesting to have this chat. I'm excited for it. Definitely so should we actually just jump into the question so if I yeah. firstly if we firstly um, talk about our final major project. So in our final year, we were um, we had to choose a brand that we were interested in and, and create a 12 month campaign um, and which had to have an aim and objectives. So I don't know if you wanted to start talking about the brand that you chosen and maybe some reasons why you were passionate about the brand. Yeah. So for like um, final year for me was all about lingerie. So that's something that I'm quite like, that's a sector that I'm quite passionate about. So my dissertation was about the lack of representation of black women in the lingerie sector. And then the brand that I chose was um, Agent Provocateur for my final major project. So I did a 12 month campaign for them. And I think doing that dissertation really informed where I saw the lingerie sector going, especially in luxury. There's such a lack of diversity and, um, it's just quite traditional in a sense and Agent Provocateur was a great brand to work on because they're not as traditional um they're quite British but also it made me think about what ambassadors I could use that are um black British or like Asian and British um and incorporate them as ambassadors um for the brand and I created like a podcast and I had people like um Dina Asher Smith come on um well this was my um strategy um and just with that I just thought how can I put more black women in um the sector of lingerie without fetishizing them and hypersexualizing them um which has been seen um by plenty of brands before so yeah it was a really cool brand to work on um and I think lingerie just as a whole is quite an intimate topic to speak about so that's why it was quite interesting to create a campaign um that included diversity in such an intimate setting yes i always find it very bizarre that like lingerie and sectors like luxury don't see black women as being consumers because you know black women have money and realistically when you're not being marketed to like they're not drawing in that crowd so i always find it almost like a missed opportunity for brands when they you know pretend that anyone that's not white doesn't buy in, into those industries yeah well it's even as small as um, like little things like when you go into um, these brands boutiques they don't have tights that are skin shade like colors you know and it's just like we've come so so far but not far enough yeah, and it was crazy. like it, the research process was really interesting because it showed me how desensitized we as black women ourselves as well can be to having a lack of product out there for us. Like I was just walking in like, yeah, I just know they're not going to have it for me. And I was like, wait, but that's actually a problem. <laughs> like let's do something about this and highlight this. So yeah. So it's like the psychology of it. Cause where they're not marketing to you, you then expect, don't expect yourself, as you said, to be you know seen or represented within the store. So it, it just kind of continues this vicious cycle where you know, black women haven't been represented or even seen equally on to their white counterparts and therefore right. almost with them not being represented and now kind of like, you know, why would a brand represent me? But then you think also that we're living such a progressive time as, you know, some people may describe it in, in the year 2020, but actually we're still, you know, finding that so many brands are really slow to catch on to, re you know, to, to have a more diverse representation, whether that's through their marketing or even in their... Um, their leadership team or actually just their employees within a store setting as well. Yeah, that's why I think both of our brands, because I know you did um, Pattern by Tracy Ellis Ross, it's so funny because we both picked brands that are very intimate and it's something that's very dear to women as a whole. So our lingerie is our first, first thing that we put on in the morning. We do our hair, you know, and it's these sectors that we've been discluded from for so many years and they're so um yeah just important in our everyday lives and they're very um important for our identity so it's funny to look at the psychology of how this is possible well, it's not funny at all but it's really yeah. interesting to look at how that will psychologically affect black women you know and just Definitely. the fashion industry as a whole 
Yeah, no, well, pattern, doing Pattern Beauty was very interesting. So Pattern Beauty is a hair care brand that specializes in like, the care and maintenance of like cur different curly hair types. So they describe themselves as offering products with curly, coily and tight texture, which can sometimes be referred to as Afro hair. So obviously this is a, an ever expanding um, market, especially within the UK, because we've gone from in in the space of like the last couple of years, we've gone from black women not being able to buy their hair products from anywhere apart from a beauty supply store to now big brands such as Boots, Superdrug, even Tesco supermarkets are now stocking um, a more diverse range of hair care. So Pattern Beauty was really interesting to me, firstly, because it was a black owned hair, hair brand. So Tracy Ellis Ross being the daughter of Diana Ross is a black woman. And actually you'll find I've, in my research that there's a lot, lot of the brands that do cater to black, many black women, aren't actually black owned. They're run by big white beauty conglomerates like L'Oreal or um, Estee Lauder, which is, you know, obviously the money's there, but unfortunately, sometimes when it comes to the marketing, there can obviously be things that go wrong because you haven't got that authentic narrative coming from someone that's part of the community that buys these products. So that's why Pattern was really interesting to me. And I also found as well that Pattern were kind of doing something new and something quite different. I, I don't know if you agree with this, but a lot of the kind of black hair care brands I followed in the past can almost, in a way, compared to the, some of their white counterparts, can seem they're a little bit dated. So they're not necessarily like tapping into this like young millennial who's digitally savvy and is on social media and is, you know, they were kind of a little bit slow to do so. So I think Pattern came in and, and it kind of came from Tracy Ellis Ross herself, who actually is very very influential on, on instagram she's someone that kind of pioneers new things such as using filters and creating filters so i think it was really interesting to see her bring her like digital mindset and her kind of comfortability in that area and like bring it into the hair care sector so that was something that when i came to doing my my own campaign for the brand which was to launch it in the uk i wanted to tap into the digital market and have something that meant that um, consumers were able to kind of upload a picture of their hair care, their, sorry, their hair type, and it would generate a lineup of products that would be best suited to their hair type. Because I was finding that a lot of other um, curly and Afro hair care brands were, you know, offering quizzes for people to fill in um, about, you know, maybe that's some questions about their hair type and Pattern wasn't offering that. So I almost felt like with them being so digital and being so savvy, like they were really missing a trick. So that was just a few things that I like wanted to kind of bring forth into the brand. Well, I think even the brand as a whole, it, it highlights how important it is to have an authentic voice behind um, the brand because then it, it does, even just you working on the strategy mm -hmm. for it, having these authentic voices that can actually relate to the audience, you then come up with these incredible innovative um, strategies that, as you said, the hair care um, sector has kind of lacked and we yeah, just, definitely. you know, just we've just we're just so used to having the same old products and not moving forward with it um so bringing something exciting to the consumer yeah. happens when an authentic voice in I the brand agree. and i think that was interesting with pattern as well is like sometimes and i think it links back to what we were saying earlier about black women not being valued as luxury customers i think even in the beauty industry there's been this tendency to kind of like market like cheap looking products products that are kind of like yeah, they're not very anything very special to black women. It's almost like they're a second, like they're an afterthought. So I think what was quite different with Pattern Beauty is they came in and were like, yes, our products are a little bit more expensive, but we want it to be luxury. We want people to have something special. And I think you could even see that in the way that their packaging and the kind of images that they use on their social media is they wanted it to be marketed as this kind of luxury brand and aspirational brand. But because realistically as well, if you look at the figures of both the American market and the British market, like black women in in this country, especially outspend white women six, like six pounds to a pound. So it's that the money is there. It's not as if there is not the disposable income within the black community to spend the money. Like if people want something, they will spend the money on it because they will value it. Well, I think that's an interesting conversation actually, because you're speaking about product that is for natural hair. Yeah. And I know that like as a black woman speaking to my black girlfriends a lot of us would rather spend more money on false hair wigs yeah. we um and then it's seen as like oh when you invest in like natural hair care products and it's interesting to look at the history of how black hair has been represented oh, in yeah, terms definitely. of it like it not being seen as luxurious so to spend on on mm -hmm. black hair that's not seen as luxurious aspirational it's almost as if why would you do that you know um, yeah, so in 
that brand alone is changing lives and changing the narrative of the way the black woman sees herself um, just in that representation alone, which I think that other brands throughout the fashion industry and the beauty industry could really, um, they should they should take that on board and try and implement that within their own strategies because by empowering that woman, you're empowering, you know, her spending power and you're encouraging her to shop with you. So, yeah, yeah I definitely and I, think and I definitely think as well, like a brand like Pattern wouldn't have been able to launch with such such success if it had launched maybe like 10, 15, even, you know, 20 years ago because of the context of women especially and obviously black women even more so having choices so i think it's important that black women can represent themselves by you know having natural hair and spending money on that but also at the same time there's no reason why black women can't spend lots of money on you know false hair so i think and that's what i think the beauty of social media is is that you can see these like multiple representations of what a black woman or whatever type of woman looks like and i think it almost now there's no reason why you know, and I think that also links back to kind of like authentic marketing and of representation of, you know, diverse people is there's always been that like token black girl or token Asian girl. And they have this, you know, this particular hairstyle, this particular look. And I think now like that's so outdated because you don't walk down the street and see one type of black woman like blackness is, you know, it comes in many shades and it's also comes in many forms. So I think, again, you can always see the brands of just use, you know, the one black model kind of for the sake of using a black model and the ones are like, okay, we want to, you know, show the, you know, what our consumer looks like and they don't look, all look the same. And that's the thing, again, having an authentic voice within your company, you will know that black women now on social media, especially are embracing all like we always have been, you know, um, like setting trends and, but now it's more so being like, there's a much more acceptance to a different type of black woman, you know? So even to link to that, I'd say with, um, agent provocateur when I was doing the research within they've been running since 1994 and they had only ever featured two black women and one of them was Naomi Campbell who we know mm -hmm. has done very well in marketing due to her crossover appeal yeah. um, whereas now um, it's very important for brands to understand that black women have no desire anymore to appeal and to have that crossover appeal and we are embracing our difference now you know um, which is very important for people to <laughs> So sorry. Don't worry, it's fine. It happens. <laughs> yeah, no, I agree. I think that's like when you think about now, like that they've only had two black models, just seems like you know, like you can't. It's kind of like unha unheard of. But but realistically, yeah. it's because some brands maybe haven't prioritized, you know, having diverse representation, you know, as much as other brands. Um. Yeah. So I mean, there was a a lot of comparison obviously when looking at my competitors and stuff like that and I think having um brands such as Savage X Fenty that has really caused um a shake-up within the lingerie um sector so that was really interesting to look at especially with the huge contrast with um big conglomerates such as Victoria's Secrets having such a controversial controversial time at the moment for inclusion and diversity obviously not just um, about skin tone but body um diversity and things like that so it was a really interesting time to look at um, the laundry sector um, unfortunately it's really funny because when speaking to consumers a lot of consumers of agent provocateur that I spoke to were black females um, and there was this sense of accepting that they're a luxury brand we're very much used to luxury brands not representing us um, but we buy from them anyway because we value luxury mm -hmm. um, which is really interesting because I think that the black community like I've read quite a few like psychological reports and things like that and we are very much invested in luxury and it's funny that for so long these luxury brands have gotten away with not representing us um, um, but particularly in lingerie um, <laughs> things like fitting our body shapes, um, even things down to um, garter belts and things like that. They're made for a very particular body type, a very slim European body type that even white women who are a bit curvier will have trouble with, you know? Um, so yeah, things like having uh, two black models, it wasn't shocking. However, it did show that then there's so much more that needs to be done. And clearly that's something that's Savage X Fenty had realised um, Rihanna being a black woman herself again just proves our point about having an authentic voice um, has been able to represent an array of different women um, but we can see in the demise of like Victoria's Secret that 
people are starting to listen and people are starting to call brands out um, when they aren't being diverse, um, which is really positive and it's really good. Um, however, I would like to see in the future with lingerie brands um, such as like Nubian Skin that cater to all different types of skin tones um, with, when it comes to bras, because psychologically, if you think about it, black women already are fetishized quite a lot. So when it comes to our private um, areas like our breasts and stuff like that we want them to be comfortable protected um, and usually drawn attention away from however if we have for instance if I wear a white top I want to be able to have a new bra underneath um, and not draw attention yeah. and for years two generations above me like a, a generations above me mm-hmm. and up would never have experienced having a nude bra you know so it's just things like that that we don't really think about and that's why I think just knowing things like that and looking into the psychology of things and how it affects us throughout life. That's something that I will be able to bring to industry um, and hope to bring to industry because of the insight and the actual life experience that I've had. It's, it's my experience, the experience of my mom, my sister, I think those things are very valuable, um, which is why we have to, um, we have to give voices um black voices asian voices um you know more of a, we need to amplify them within our companies because they we have very unique perspectives that other people are able to understand you know no definitely and i think you can see with brands that obviously are trying to target perhaps black women or asian women and if they are not um if they don't have a diverse team behind them because sometimes it can feel quite uh, i think I mentioned before tokenism but also quite stereotypical in their representation so it's kind of like not seeing black women as like well-rounded human beings they're just this one caricature or an idea that's been fed through the media like basically since slavery that you know the black women is hi- yeah. as you mentioned about being hypersexual and they're you know masculine or something and you know that this you know that they're not worthy of being considered by brands as as consumers so I think definitely you can tell there's a major difference in terms of brands that have got a diverse team behind them not just the models that they use because I think we can see beyond that now of having you know if you've got a runway full of black models that's amazing but if you're designer makeup artist hair artist like every single other person behind scenes is white or European it's just you can see it it's kind of like quite blatant especially in the era of transparency as well where everyone wants to see you know how things are made and where where our products are coming from and who's who's behind the team I think it's really important but yeah going back to what you said before like why I think it's really important for people like yourself and I to get into you know the industry into the PR industry is because we can bring our experiences like from the day you were born you were a black woman you know so you have a lived experience that you know money can't buy and it doesn't matter how many yeah white women or white men or whoever is in the team they're never going to be able to authentically speak to the community in the same way that someone like you would be able to yeah and I think it's just about understanding as well like it's funny what you just mentioned about um like a runway and having you know white um makeup artists etc because that's something that we've been speaking about for years you know like um having white makeup artists can't do our makeup or can't do our hair and now having a brand like pattern you like people will be more um yeah like they can't run away from it and pattern are doing so well that um makeup artists now like and hair um, stylists have to be able to do those black models hair you know so it's all well and good them putting black models in the show I know yeah Um, you know but then okay you get there and it's like well we can't do your hair or for instance it's something else that you helped me think about was um, when I was doing my research about the launcher whenever I don't want to say who the brands are but particular brands very big brands would use a black model in their runway shows they always had cheetah print on they always had something that was quite animalistic and um it directly links to a fetish so yeah. like someone like me is gonna see that and be like oh my why does she have um you know leopard print on and nobody else has that um so these stylists have to be more understanding of the culture and what these different symbolism like these symbols mean um things is massive. so yeah 
No, I agree. I think even like if you look at like sometimes how Asian women have been presented in the fashion context, it's always that they're kind of like made to look really young. And it goes back to that stereotype of like, you know, Asian women being kind of submissive. And obviously we know that not to be true, but that's something that seems to sell when people seem to, you know, brands especially seem to kind of want to keep pushing. And it's like, again, just kind of seeing the Asian woman through this like narrow perspective, this narrow stereotype been shown in cinema or in the media so I think it's the same for black women as you mentioned obviously with your che- with the cheetah print um also like from what you were yeah. saying in terms of um authentic experiences do you have any anxiety about entering an industry where maybe the only black person in the room yeah it's funny you say that because I was going to mention I was going to say that to you as well because it's interesting what you just said there about um, Asian women and the idea that we're sold, like we're, we're sold ideas about lots of different types of women. And I think growing up as a child, when you watch movies, you're, I, I was always interested in fashion from a very young age yeah. and anybody that I saw in industry was white. Um, and I think for a while I felt like unless there was no one for me to look at and be like, Oh, if, I act like her or if I um make the contacts that she's made or if I there was no representation of I could be like that woman um and even when you do get a black woman reach a particular height let's use Naomi Campbell again for example I've grown up watching this black supermodel be super successful but completely demonized in the newspapers and it was almost as if no matter what you do <laughs> you're always going to be looked at a particular type of way. So I think if I am honest with myself, it it is something that I was anxious about before. But I think in the current climate, I've just so happened to be graduating at a time where obviously the Black Lives Matter movement is happening and everyone's waking up a bit more to these issues. All that anxiety that I have, it's like it's come to this point where everyone's talking about it now. And it's like, oh, we are actually being seen and we are actually being highlighted that we, are, we, I don't know how to explain it without saying, sounding really odd, but we are like people too that can actually achieve something within fashion. Um, but we can even see it now with, I think you sometimes think to yourself, is this anxiety just built up in my head? But it's validated with things like Edward Enfield going to the Vogue house and being told to use a loading bay. Like, of course we're going to have anxiety if you make it to be the editor of Vogue and you're still being treated, um, you know, to be expected to have a particular type of job. So I definitely think it is something that is, makes you anxious no matter what, um, being in these spaces. However, I think the need for representation does override my anxiety in a way. And I'm just really determined to hopefully make a change. And yeah, I think we're quite used to dealing with things like this, um, which is unfortunate. Um, But yeah, something's got to change. Something's got to change. And we have to be the ones to do it, I guess. No, I 100% agree. I remember before we actually started the course, like saying I was interested in PR, like I, my, I, like my view of PR and actually my family's view of PR was always that it was very white and middle class because traditionally it's been um, kind of white women, you know, from places like Surrey or Chelsea or kind of like well-off areas and they come in and they've got the money behind them because maybe they are able to do unpaid internships. They're able to kind of have, use the money that's, you know, there and by all means, that's fair enough. But um, so I kind of didn't see fashion PR but actually the fashion industry as a whole especially the business side of it being something that any the one that wasn't white could be part of and I do think it was really interesting what you're saying there was no one really to look up to and I think even if you do look at kind of like the editors and stuff in the fashion publications like they've only been editors-in-chief and and roles such as that in like the last five or you know five or so years it's not and we're what 21 now so that's only since we were kind of 16 but when we were younger yeah. most impressionable ages there was that wasn't there mm-hmm. and um I also sometimes think that yeah as you said that the kind of seeing how the industry has been and all these issues like you as I said before we need people that look like me that look like you to kind of be in that space to kind of like help you know create um, authentic voices but I also 
find as well, I don't know if it, you, you can relate to this, but being, I've done internships being like the only like non-white person in the room. And I feel like you're almost ex expected to do two jobs. You're doing the same job as everyone else, but you're also like the educator. And it's the most tiring thing ever because I feel like black women, especially like emotional labor is just something is expected of you. And you just have to kind of like, you know, if you want to get by, you need to, you need to fulfill this role. And it's like, but no one else is having to do that in the room. Like, why am I having to do a full days of work, work, of work, but also explain to you, you know, what Black Lives Matter is, obviously before we had the Black Lives Matter movement that we have now, but also, yeah. you know, and I'm having to explain to you why we should, you know, not do something in this way. And maybe we should go down this route. It's just quite tiring. Don't know if you feel the same. Yeah. No, I, I can agree. And it's funny because I think there's multiple layers of emotional labor there's not being understood in the workplace it's having to put on your best face at all times because you don't want to be seen in a particular type of way because naturally any personality trait you have comes with that extra added connotation because of your race you know um things that are normal to everyday people such as challenging things in work you have to approach in a different oh, way yeah. so imagine challenging oh. race <laughs> it's like a yeah, whole different level of anxiety mm -hmm. Yeah. So even once, so we have this level of anxiety going into the job and then it sustains itself throughout the job, mm -hmm. um, which is, it's, it is quite discouraging, I believe. And I think that's why people celebrated um, Edward Edenfall becoming editor in chief because of, because we knew that that meant that there was less explaining. There, there would be less explaining um, of people who are relevant. Um, Vogue would become a publication that would actually talk to us because he would understand it and he would hire people that understands mm -hmm. our needs. Um, and I think it's a funny thing to think about because I think our needs haven't been thought about for a very long time. Mm -hmm. So that's why working in certain spaces, it's draining because we're not even being catered to anyway and we're not a priority to be catered to however hopefully with everything that has happened this year um and the appointments that have been made we will start to be looked at as a as a marketable um yeah a marketable audience finally definitely <laughs> with edward Enfield, um, and like, having yeah. Sorry, carry on. I was just going to say, with um, hiring people that aren't that know how to market to us and to provide for us, um, it's a long time coming. We shouldn't even have to ask for it, but you know, here we it's are. Like we're receiving the crumbs. Isn't it? Do you know what I mean it's really like they're giving us a lot there? But something like Edward Enfield's appointment always like obviously amazing, but it also makes me so frustrated because I'm like, this man has worked in the industry since he was 18. He is now obviously much older and it's like taken this long for his work to be recognized you know whereas i almost feel like someone that with you know much fewer skills and and less talent can do mm. you know his job for five minutes and then their editor-in-chief next wednesday but he's had to have this sustained career for like 30 plus years to even be considered for a role it's kind of like quite frustrating that you seem to have to work like twice as hard and like have to constantly prove yourself every everything that comes along to be like, look, pick me, I am actually good enough. Whereas, you know, would your white clowns part have to do the same? I'm, I, I don't know. I don't think that they would. Well, it, see, you, even my question to that is, do you feel, do you, what is your personal attachment to that emotion and to that experience do you feel that like you still feel like you're going to have to work 10 times harder or do you feel like there's, this point now where you're kind of getting like I don't actually want to work for a company that's going to make me feel like that because I have I feel like there is this shift where we're a bit like mm, don't know if I feel like putting up with that anymore yeah. um so it's like you know treading that fine line of you want to make a change in this industry but then it's also like is it worth going through the emotional labor as you described yeah, it I think for me it's definitely the latter I think it's like making me realize that like if someone isn't going to value you like you've got you know this hard work behind you from your degree and actually like anything that you have collected over the years and you know you can prove on your CV or you know I don't want to work for someone that's just going to hire me because I'm you know as you know being mixed race maybe I'm more palatable or whatever or that I can be you know come in as your diversity hire or whatever but I think it's that's the thing that made me realize is I think 
with it was amazing that Edward Ennis were coming in, but it also showed to me like how um, Vogue has become less relevant. It's almost like they had to do that to kind of get people back on board. Mm -hmm. But I'm not discrediting his work at all. I think he's amazing. And that was the best thing that they ever did. And they should have got rid of Alexander Shulman several years before, but that's just my opinion. <laughs> yeah. Um, what was our final question? Oh yeah. So we were talking about, um, we've obviously talked a lot about brands that we don't want to work for because they're not exactly, you know, creating an authentic narrative. Is there any brands that you feel like are getting diversity and inclusion and are showcasing it well to their, their audiences? Is there anyone that you've got in mind? I mean, what's difficult is that <laughs> I feel like at the moment it's one person. <laughs> it's literally <laughs> Rihanna Fenty. Like, oh, yeah, it's yeah. like Rihanna. It's like, like just Rihanna. The industry's going. Like, <laughs> honestly, makeup, like, that's the, the first person I think of is Rihanna. Um, I think a brand that has stood out to me in terms of inclusion, authentic inclusion, because I don't think that inclusion can't be authentic if the person at the top is white. No, I definitely. Um, yeah. I think it. Yeah, I just want to clarify that. Um, and I think that a brand that does that really well is Jackmus. Um, he has been authentically representative from the very beginning. I remember going on his, uh, I think it was 2017, I went on his website. And I was like, I've never been on a website and seen so many black models before. It was just shocking. Okay. In fact, I think every single model was black. And I was like, oh my God, this is it. like a white male from... France, like some beach in France, like Mas Mas Masai or whatever it is. And I was like, wow, like that's so interesting um, that he saw that to be a problem and highlighted it because he's obviously been dressing Rihanna for a very long time yeah. now, um, Kim Kardashian. So in terms of he didn't carry that narrative of luxury fashion, that's very... Um, yeah, it doesn't include everybody. He included Kim K with her like with different body type, Rihanna, and then of course the, the different models. So yeah, I'd say Rihanna and Jacquemus are two brands that I'd say have done a pretty good job in it being authentic. Because there are a lot of brands out here that could be like, oh, what, what about us? We've got a black model, but it's not, you know, yeah, it's not authentic, yeah. you know? No, I think for me, if I'm thinking about brands, obviously I would say that my brand is pretty good, but I'm not going to, you know, I've spoken about that enough. But I think looking at the beauty industry, um, two brands have actually been quite, that are quite interesting in terms of their diversity. So firstly, Bleach London is actually obviously a hair salon in Soho. But what I thought was most interesting yeah. about them is if you look at their marketing and their social media, it is very, in terms of representing race, LGBTQ plus people, different ages as well, has been really good. And I think what was interesting about them is, prior to last year they were kind of getting a little bit of um a few of their consumers black consumers saying a lot of your products don't work for our hair type and instead of them kind of being like you know shouting back at them they were like we hear you and they've come out and they've made uh, one of the first hair ble like bleaches just for that like, suited for type three and type four hair type wow so they kind of really took on board and said right you know you know we haven't thought about this thank you for bringing this to our attention and they obviously um carried that forth you know, and, and made that happen, which obviously then makes that consumer feel valued um, as mm. well. And also another one that I th find interesting is Trini London. I'm not sure if you've heard of it. And it's like a um, mm. makeup brand. It's quite new. The founder um, is Trini Woodall, who was a kind of a fashion stylist in, in the past, and she's kind of moved into the beauty industry. But what I find most interesting about her is she the kind of work that you can see displayed on their social media also. So they have um, a lot of tutorials on that, but they're not kind of like the big beauty makeup artists it's not jeffree star or you know someone along those lines they use small influencers black asian um male influ makeup influencers as well and also they use a lot of older women so women over the age of 50 over the age of 60 and show how they you know how they treat their makeup routine as well because obviously beauty doesn't have a sell by date you know people still consume beauty products after the age of 30 you know so i think that's another one that's been quite interesting in terms of like how they represent themselves because you can see that they're not just trying to be a brand that's for you know 15 year old girls they want women to kind of buy from their brand whether they're 15 or whether they're 55 so I think it's quite interesting that if you see yourself represented that you would be more likely to want to engage with the brand yeah but yeah I think that's good um, one thing I did want to know yes. I just wanted to note that I think 
um, something that was quite important to speak about in terms of um, brands um, that we feel like we could relate to, because I think it's funny, for your final major project, you chose a brand that represents you, mm-hmm. um, and I chose a brand that doesn't. <laughs> So it's really interesting um, in terms of just how we're able, like, I think for me, it really opened my eyes to how much um, there is this acceptance of brands that don't um, cater to us. Um, And we're very much used to going into industry with that mindset. But I think in light of everything that's gone on now um, and LCF as well, like my tutors were like, Monet, like go for a brand that's actually going to represent you. Why do you keep on going for like, whistles and cause like yeah. they're like they you just they don't represent you you know and I think it is really important that people within a company feel valued and represent it's going to be very difficult for you to move forward with um creating a great future for them as a PR so I think that's definitely something for um black um and asian people to think about when going into industry like what is that brand going to do for you is your life going to be made easier by working for that brand or harder you know and are they going to respect you Um, you know so i yeah i definitely agree with everything you said that i think we should probably wrap it up um (laughs) so yeah so that was us discussing inclusion and um diversity within the fashion industry and beauty industry as well Yeah. yeah I really enjoyed that. Bye. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> okay, good luck.